Hey, this is the Metaverse panel, the many faces of horror. We have three of them, maybe four if you include me. Three of them are wearing black t-shirts. One did not get the memo. Um, hello to everyone from Read Pop. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to do our best to try and entertain you. This is the many faces of horror. You're, you're seeing so few faces of horror, though right now, um, so we'll do our best to overcompensate. Joining us is with his uh, beguiling plug-in headphones and his Poundland shellac t-shirt, it's Paul Tremblay, whose Survivor song just came out. Paul, how's the book doing? Do people want to read about Hi. a pandemic right now? Can you tell? Maybe. I, I, I'm just realizing I've never seen you in a black t-shirt, so even if we <laughs> gave you the memo, I don't think it, it would have worked. I found one in my closet. Um, it's got a suspicious stain on the front, though. I don't know. Um, also joining us, Christina Henry, whose new book, Looking Glass, which is the final one in the Chronicles of Alice, just came out in April. Christina, how are you? Where are you? Are you in Chicago? Yes, I am in Chicago. And can I just say, you are the only professional on this entire panel who actually has the freaking books of your co-panelists up behind <laughs> you. You're a rock star, dude. Actually, it's just because I'm a fan. I'm like a super fan. And like I said earlier, that if I was at the panel with you guys in person, I would be like, please sign my book. I'm such a big fan. Um, and then you'd probably kill us all and cut off our feet. Um, <laughs> next up, last but not least, is Stephen Graham Jones, who's the only good Indians, just came out uh, and is in its third printing, I think. Um, and Stephen, you are in a different room than I normally see you in when we Zoom. I am. Where yeah. Yeah. Where I'm at my house, I'm just, I'm moving my desk. Oh. That's all, yeah. Wait, is this the new desk location? This is the new desk location. Yeah, I used to, it was like a up against my DVD rack, but yeah. I unpacked all my books, or I unpacked some of my books, so now they're behind me. Um, so we're talking about the many faces of horror and I want to, you know, this is what horror panels are weird because sometimes they're just so amorphous and strange. And then thank God this isn't one of the ones that's like, why do you write horror? Which always sounds to me like someone saying, why are you so gross? Um, <laughs> but let's get right into it because I want to ask about childhood fears and traumas. Um, we're going deep. Uh, and Christina, I wanted to talk to you, have you kicked that off because your, your Alice books are all based on a children's book. Um, mm -hmm. So did children's books like freak you out when you were a kid? Was there one that haunted you? Um, I was actually one of those kids who was really, really credulous. So I believed anything, you know, I believed everything was real. Um, and I don't, that didn't really go away, I think, until my late teens. Um, so I was definitely one of those kids where if I saw it in a movie, then, then that was real. I mean, Freddy Krueger scared me. You thought Freddy was real? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, and my bedroom was at the end of a hallway. So um, if I had to get up to pee in the middle of the night, I was afraid he was going to be around the corner waiting for me on the way to the bathroom. I mean, I think this is a valid fear. Yeah, no, totally. So wait, <laughs> wait, besides Freddy Krueger, what was it that you read that like really stuck with you that you believed was true? Um, I mean, I believed in anything. And actually, as a kid, I didn't read a lot of scary per se things because I was so credulous. You know, it's not, I'm the kind of person who kind of came into horror sideways through fantasy later in life. So um, I, you know, if I saw, if I read anything, I thought it was true. I thought there were dragons. I thought there were unicorns. I thought whatever. It was real. Like dragon, but like they'd gone extinct or were oh, like yeah. still out there somewhere. Like hiding. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was one of those kids. And actually, even as an adult, I'm still, I'm ready to believe uh, like whatever the, is in a book or in a movie. Like I don't approach things ironically. I, I, I'm, I'm like the Ghostbusters. I'm ready to believe you. So let me ask a question. Quick show of hands from everyone. It's going to be a couple of rapid fire ones. Um, so do people on this panel believe in UFOs? Hands up if you do. Like, well, like what do you mean believe in UFOs? Like believe they've like, believe do you, they've do you like think abducted that blind people saucers or? that flying saucers exist and, and are aliens from other planets. Well, I mean, I, yeah, it doesn't actually, I mean, I think they're visiting here though. Okay. Like I believe, I believe there's aliens. I just yeah. don't know if they've have come here. I'm not ready to commit to that level. Okay. Wait, 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 quick show of hands. Yes or no. It's no, no prevaricating life after death. 
No. no. Ooh, that's a bummer. Oh, Stephen. All right. Um, <laughs> believe that ghosts are real and people have encountered them. No. <laughs> um, believe that people. I'm still can afraid of them, though. <laughs> exactly. So you do yeah. believe. Um, believe that people can communicate with the spirits of the dead. No. Believe in ESP. Man, Christina, for someone who started out so credulous, you become so yeah. cynical and jaded. I life, am. life has worn her down. That's wait, true. Wait, last two: Lost City of Atlantis. Stephen just please in everything. <laughs> <laughs> and do you believe that there are more serial killers working than the FBI's current estimates? Yes. Okay, yeah, we all do. Okay, so Stephen, childhood fears. What were you particularly credulous? I think I'm just like Christina. I was, I believed everything, and it's mostly because I had this book, Strange Stories, Amazing Facts. I've never, what is yeah. that? It's a Reader's Digest book. Let's see. Oh my yeah, God. Oh, cool. And that, I, my, I would have to hide this book because if I didn't hide it, I would read it every night and stay up all night, all, every night in a row, and I'd be like two days without sleep and a frazzled fifth grader and everything. I'm, but this is stories about like um, a kid goes out to the well in 1870 and his tracks stop halfway to the well and he's never seen again. And I had that, I was so terrified I was going to be that kid because we lived out in the country and I mean, anything can be in the sky at night, you know, and I was so sure that I was going to get snatched. And there's so many stories like this. There's, you know, the, the hitchhikers who are ghosts and I'm, um, the ships that are sometimes there and sometimes not. It's just an encyclopedia of every scary thing. And that, I didn't, like, like Christina, I didn't know that this, I thought this was fact. I didn't know that some of this was questionable, you know? Well, it um, says right there in the title, Amazing Facts. <laughs> I know, it does, it does. Um, yes, yeah, so I was, I believed everything. And also I started to read the Inquirer in like fourth grade and I thought it was true too. I read everything in there as gospel, you know? And I'm, um, you know, really, if I had to pick one boogeyman from my kidhood, though, I later figured out it was Max Hedrum. I didn't know it was Max Hedrum at first. When I was in third grade, we moved into this house that this guy had been building, and he had abandoned it because he ran out of money. And so it's pretty much just a frame and tar paper and some random sheets of sheetrock. And under the stairs in that little cub like Harry Potter room, you know, under the stairs, I found an old, a magazine that was all faded, and it had this guy with these glowing green eyes. And I was so terrified of that magazine, I wouldn't touch it. And I knew I knew I should never touch that magazine. And so what I did was I caught a lot of black widows and killed them and put them all around it and then put candles in between the black widows. So I made a circle around it so that that, that person on the magazine couldn't get out to get me. And then years later, I saw Max Hedrum and I realized that was Max Hedrum on that cover, you know? Wait, Max Hedrum had glowing green eyes behind his shades? The, the dude under my um, stairs did. Yeah. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure it was Max Hedrum. <laughs> <laughs> so wait really quickly because one of the things yeah. i think is interesting is the book that reader's digest book does say facts right on the cover mm -hmm. so there's a comma though it says strange stories comma amazing facts it's yeah. true there, there could but, be a separation so do people think because i remember <laughs> as a kid like there were all those books like scary stories to tell in the dark and things like that i mean that was a little after my time but all mm -hmm. these books of like myths and folklore and stuff that i really didn't get were made up i really thought those mm -hmm. were sort of like mm -hmm. true on some level did other people have this problem i mean christina you did paul did you believe this stuff um no i mean i, mean, I have to admit the horrible admission that i really wasn't much of a reader at all as a kid other than like i would read you know for school like a good boy but uh you know, for me, it was all movies and just my own imagination. Now, <laughs> all the questions you asked where I raised our hand, if you had woken me up at like 2.30 in the morning, you know, it gave me five minutes to compose myself maybe, <laughs> but then ask me those questions, I would probably raise my hand. Um, but in the light of day, I, you know, I, I give in to my quote unquote rational side. <laughs> um, but no, no, for me, it was all movies. TV and movies all scared the crap out of me. Um, we had a program in my area called Creature Double Feature. Um, in the, on Saturdays in the first movie, and this was like, I'm aging myself, but like UHF channels mm -hmm. <laughs> had oh, to yeah. like change both, you know, um, you know, the first movie was always a kaiju movie like Godzilla. And that was my favorite. That's what sucked me in. And if I stuck around for the second movie, those are the ones that gave me nightmares. It would be stuff like the brain that wouldn't die or even, um, attack of the killer shrews. I, I vividly remember some attack of the killer shrews nightmares that I had where I was inside that, you know, at the very end of the movie, I'm sorry, I'm spoiling it for everybody, but they build sort of like this mini hut that they sort of out of tin 
you know, that they move through. So, I mean, really, I guess they're not that scary if the shrews can't, like, just knock over, like, the little mini tank that's operated by, like, Flintstones-like feet. <laughs> but for me, that was terrifying, shrews. Well, well, speaking of building things, I always found it really terrifying in horror movies as a kid when some monster would build something, like in Empire of the Ants, I think, you know, where the ants build the giant uh, hive, or Phase 4, phase where four. the ants... Build direct, or um, uh, what was the oh kingdom of the spiders where at the end they look and the entire town's covered in webs there's something about these animals having yeah. some kind of like agenda it's really terrifying or the, or the, the sand kings that was terrifying man oh George yeah the sand kings yeah, yeah. kingdom so, of the spiders actually gave me lifelong arachnophobia like i never recovered yeah. That well, it's also when they find, isn't it Scatman Crothers? They find with like the hole eaten in the behind his ear in his oh, truck wow. by the spiders. It's awful. Wow. Um, is that the one with Shatner? Yes. 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 <laughs> Gave me a fear of really, Shatner. <laughs> yeah, but it really is so many spiders in that, and they're mostly tarantulas, which, from what I understand, are pretty harmless. But still. Yeah. So, Stephen, just to jump back for a second, the story about the kid walking to the well and his foot, mm -hmm. did they ever give an explanation for that or just these things happen? No, th these things happen. His name was Oliver Larch, and I know that because I read that <laughs> obsessively, and I wrote a novel about it, Demon Theory. <laughs> I, I couldn't let it go. I was trying to figure it out myself, you know? Um, no, there's no explanation. I assume it was a pterodactyl or a goblin or something, but I don't have any idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what were people's coping techniques to deal with this stuff? Stephen, you constructed... Um, circles that could potentially out of poisonous arachnids that could potentially mm -hmm. burn your house down. Mm -hmm. Paul, did you have coping techniques for childhood fears? Yes. Well, one, uh, my brother is five years younger than me, but already at like age eight had probably seen uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But he was my excuse of things like we were watching it in the room of like poltergeist, for example, when the, the face tearing off scene, my brother would be my excuse. Come on, Dan, you're too young to watch this, you know, because I didn't want to see the face ripping off scene. Uh, <laughs> I know, and at night, for an embarrassingly long time, I slept with a fortress of stuffed animals around my head um, to protect me from, you know, the dark in the closet. Like, I mean, I, I it was it. probably literally like 10 or 20. Nice. You know, and they so had a certain order, like I had a triceratops that, because it had a big hump back, would fit like on this side of my face. Um, you know, anyway, mm -hmm. so a lot of, yeah. and, you know, and I had and to have so a hole, obviously, to breathe. And I was doing <laughs> So if we wake you up in the middle of the night, that's what you need the five minutes to do is to take apart your stuffed <laughs> exactly. animal fortress. Yes. Um, Christina, what was your coming down? Did you just develop an invulnerable bladder so you never had to go pee and avoid yeah. Freddy Krueger? I would just stay in bed. I mean, the blankets are magical. I don't know if you know that, but if they're pulled all the way up, the monsters cannot get you. If it's, it's when you expose your flesh, then you're in trouble. Then, yeah, you know, yeah. they can see that you're there. Yeah. 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 Well, that is a weird thing, right? This childhood belief that, like, as long as part of you can't be seen, you're okay. Like, I'm not seeing it. It can't see me. It's really weird. Stephen, besides um, occult circles? Um, yeah, you know, there's actually two things now that Christina says that. I didn't realize the other thing was a thing until she said it, but I still sleep with the dark side of every blanket up because I think if I sleep with the light side up, that's just attracting aliens, you know? So I need to sleep mm. with the dark side up because they don't have the technology to see dark things. I don't know what's up. Um, but as a kid... I have this um, this taxidermy dismounted deer on my wall. You can't see it here. Um, and growing up, I was terrified of that deer. I knew it was. I knew that there was a whole deer behind the wall that was going to come get me. And and so my fix for that was I had to always have that deer in my room where I slept. And if I could wake up and see that deer and see that it wasn't moving, then I could go back to sleep. But if I woke up and didn't see the deer, then that would be the end of everything, you know. And the bad thing is, in this one house we lived in in sixth grade. I had it right, right, right above my bed and I woke up one night and it had fallen on me. And that was the worst of all possibilities. You know? oh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, still have to, I still have to keep it in the room. I don't feel safe without my deer up there. <laughs> uh, so what about horror stuff or scary stuff as a kid you loved? Like for me as a little kid, my grandmother had tons of comic books and a lot of Tomb of Draculas. And I loved Blade, the character, because he was so angry. Just like Dracula would be like, hello, Blade. He'd be like, I'm going to stake you. People, like no one could make friends with Blade. He would just attack you. And I found that kind of anger really comforting. I was like, yeah, Blade, we know what he's going to do. He's just going to stake you. So what was the horror stuff you loved? Like the first love you had as a kid that made you feel good? Christina, you want to start? 
Yeah, um, I was trying to think because it's like I mentioned earlier, I didn't really come into horror until later in life. Because when you're a kid who believes in everything, you do not want to right. read stories that scare you. Unfortunately, I don't know if you guys know this or how many sleepovers that had a lot of girls that you attended as a kid, but girls at sleepovers basically only watch horror movies. Because everybody has an older sibling who could go to the video store back when those existed and rent something completely age inappropriate. So probably from like age 8 to 13, every sleepover I went to and all the girls had sleepover birthday parties featured horror movies. And I was always the one who was trying not to watch, you know, through my fingers. And there was always one person who thought everything was hilarious. And then the, the balance would be screaming. So I have no idea how our parents got through these, these parties. But um, I don't remember loving horror until I was like mm, 13, 14. And that That's was because, that well, Stephen King tricked me. Because <laughs> um, he wrote The Eyes of the Dragon, which at the time, my favorite books were Lord of the Rings, and The Eyes of the Dragon was a fantasy. So I read that, and I was like, this isn't scary. His books aren't scary. I can read his other books. And that was a mistake. But by then, I was addicted. So, Wait, what was the first one you read? That was not Eyes of the Dragon? Yeah. Um, yeah. I read Christine. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. Like, really? Yeah. At 13. What would you yeah. think of it? Like, Do you remember... I remember staying up until like two in the morning, like being afraid to put the book down that something might happen if I stopped reading it. It was almost like if I could get through it, you know, like a surgical procedure. <laughs> yeah. Steven, first love? My first horror love, I didn't even, I, I keep, I have other stuff written down, but I can't, I keep coming up with other stuff. And the other stuff now that I'm just remembering is in first grade, it could have been second grade. I somehow got the record, uh, a Kiss record, and I want to say it was Alive too, maybe, where all four of them are just jumping out of, like they're in, in makeup and platform yeah. boots and leather and everything, just jumping. Maybe it's Destroyer. I don't remember for sure. And I couldn't touch the record player, so I couldn't listen to this album. But I would sit in my room for like all my extra time and look at that cover and, you know, look at Gene Simmons with his demon face and his tongue and everything. And I'm, I started almost immediately every time I could get to town to get to a 7-Eleven, they used to sell blood tablets at 7-Eleven and I would save up my money for, uh, they cost a quarter and I would get blood tablets and I'd always have blood tablets in my mouth and I could always be leaking blood out. You know, I thought I was going to be like these guys, you know? So that's where it starts for me. It was uh, a fascination, which kind of became an obsession, I guess. Paul, what about you? Uh, no blood tablets. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if Godzilla doesn't count, which I guess it doesn't, it was really sort of the universal horror movies. Because those mm. really? I enjoyed, like you know, like Creature from the Black Lagoon, especially was always my favorite. Mm. Um, you know, and Wolfman. My brother was like Wolfman, and was his favorite. So you know, so it was, there was early bonding, sibling bonding through those kind of horror movies. But honestly, everything else just scared the hell out of me. But I would still watch it. Like I don't know, in in those days, when I say those days, like the early to mid '80s, you know, they would show on network television in the afternoon, like uh, Devil Dog Hound from Hell, and. Um, uh, oh shoot! What's the one in the desert? Uh, Race the Devil. <laughs> oh, the is the or, one with um, Warren Oates and uh, yeah, Peter Fonda. Yeah, Warren Oates, Peter yeah, Fonda, yeah. Uh, uh, Laura the Swit. Yeah, um, yeah. So all these like seventy satanic movies would just be on in the afternoon, and it's like, well, it's it's light out. I guess I'll watch, you know. And then like the end of Race with the Devil, so terrifying when their RV is, you know, entrapped in this big circle of fire, and all the Satanists in their robes. Why is it always robes? Do, do they, are the robes necessary? I, I think the like, robes are because they're naked underneath for the orgy, maybe. you know? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. They didn't show that on network television in 1980, <laughs> whatever. But, uh, well, maybe the robes are like a smot, like a work ape, like a woodworking apron, you know, to keep your street clothes clean from, like, blood. I don't know. Uh, Lots I of think, uses. I think, I think the robes erase the hierarchy so everybody's at the same, at the same level. They all look the yeah. same, you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. My mom's, my mom's mother, so my grandmother was in church when she was a kid. And this was like 20, no, earlier than that, a little bit earlier in the 20s. Um, and she remembered one Sunday when all these guys in, in white robes came in. This was down south. And they were there to put an offering in the plate, like a, a sum of money they'd raised. 
And her mom kept saying, you know, they were all in their robes and hoods. And her mom kept saying, don't look at their shoes. Don't look at their shoes. Because that was the only thing you could see. And you could recognize people by their shoes and the pants. And the thing was, if you don't see it, you don't know who it is. And they were, I mean, they were all people they knew from the, the wow. town. Um, wow. So maybe that's it with Satanists. You know, don't look at their shoes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. So, Christina, you brought up... Um, surgery. Um, and Paul, <laughs> you just wrote a book about a pandemic. Um, so yeah. sickness, has anyone here had a surgery or a sickness that really just like freaked you out about the human body? Um, I've had a lot of surgeries on my knees and ankles and, um, but none of those freaked me out. What the mm -hmm. one surgery I would call it a surgical procedure that has permanently forever freaked me out was Growing up, we worked cattle, and the cattle get like blowflies, you know, like the, the flies lay eggs in their skin, and um, uh -huh. and you have to get those flies out. And the way you get those flies out is you save your glass Coke bottles, and then you empty them, you, you drink the Coke, and you put the mouth onto this dry, you can see like a dry hole if you part the hair of the cow's hide, you can see like a dry hole, like a crater. And if you look about a half inch down there, you see the round head of like a grub, you know? And so you put the glass bottle on there and you hit the back of it real hard and it pops that that baby fly up into the bottle and it's the most gross thing in the world and um and the the old man who are just super tough and don't care about anything they don't need a bottle they just use their fingers and do it and it goes all over their face you know and that was yeah. just oh. yeah i didn't I, wow. I mean i grew up working cattle but i i, I kind of suspected i didn't want to be a rancher you know <laughs> paul are you like a hypochondriac no, I am not a hypochondriac. I have had some strange surgeries, though. I mean, strange meaning like not like a sports injury or um, when I and actually I'm writing about this quite a bit in the novel I'm working on. When I was in high school, I had uh, scoliosis in multiple parts of my spine. Um, my lower back I was able to correct with a brace and exercise, but when it's like high in between the shoulder blades, it's really hard to get at. So six days after graduating high school, my curve was like 45 degrees to the right. Um, I had spinal oh. fusion um, where they took bone from my hip and metal rods and connected me. I was six foot when I went under and six foot three when I woke up. Um, Are you kidding? No. Um, Whoa. So I was like, oh, I'm like the Terminator, living, skele you know, living skin surrounding a metal exoskeleton. <laughs> and I've never set off a metal detector, which has always been a bummer because uh, the metal <laughs> rods are still back there. Uh, the more, I mean, and that was like, you know, possible for a week. It was, you know, tough surgery. The gross one, though, <laughs> was I had uh, sleep apnea in my mid to late 20s. And part of it was just because I was born with <laughs> not a lot of space in my face, essentially, which, you know, like, even as a kid, before braces, I'd have my palate widened. And so anyway, their solution to my sleep apnea was we're just going to cut out your tonsils and uvula, literally just make a wider airway, um, you know, so I don't have a punching bag in the back of my throat. The one fun thing I did, but I was teaching at the time, after I had the surgery, I rolled up a piece of gum and put it in a little vial of formaldehyde and raffled it off to eighth graders at my school. So I, I wonder if there's some now adult somewhere who has my uvula or my fake uvula. Probably Christina. Really she said she was a super fan. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm a super fan. I bought it on eBay, Paul. <laughs> I wish I still had it. Really quickly, the gross part of it was, it was sort of funny, though. They also did deviated septum. And I know I have a big nose, but they told me with the deviated septum, they put splints and gauze back here um and so i imagine like you know splints that would fit like a mouse's paw or something and they said oh if you know if you're home and you start gushing blood it's not a big deal even though it seems like a big deal just come back into the hospital so i was in boston started gushing blood that was a fun cab ride right i shed like a t-shirt to my face you know blood red uh, so i get in there and like oh we're just going to take out the the we're going to take out the splints and the, the the guy came out with this what i'm just calling like the reverse pliers an instrument that just like opens put my head back, just opened the nostril and went in to get the splints as I'm awake. And I swear it was like, dun, 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 dun. like what came out of my face? I could not believe the size. It wow. felt like it was like the size of a playing card on both sides. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. Christina, surgeries, diseases that freaked you out? I, yeah, nothing. I've, wow. I've been, okay. I've been fairly indestructible. I mean, I was pregnant, but that was more traumatic for my husband than for me. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the human body is just a tough, weird, resilient thing. And I feel very fragile about mine. But you know, at the end of the day, you can just bang on it with a wrench and stick rods in it. Um, 
Anyway, Tina's Dude. like the first first woman I've ever heard say, "Yeah, pregnancy was harder on my husband." Come on. I know. I know. No, it was honestly <laughs> fine. It really was. Really? Um, yeah. No, it was fine. Um, the 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 only time I was I panicked was my son was early so that was the oh my god I'm having the baby right now like right now <laughs> like five weeks before he's supposed to be here mm -hmm. but other than that I was fine I mean I didn't even have an epidural so Whoa. yeah wow. I was I've always thought pregnancy was so scary because it's a process that like labor is a process that once it starts, it doesn't really stop. Like you're just in it. It could be three hours. It could be 30 hours. You're just at the it's, mercy of your body. It's true. But there's also, there's so many interventions that people do now that actually kind of interfere with that process. And true. I was in the delivery room and I was like, I don't want an epidural. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you don't want an epidural. Like you're going to want one. And I was like, no, I really don't want one. And so they made me sign the the form anyway. And I was like, fine, fine. I'll sign the form if you just go away. Because I wanted them to leave the room so I could just like relax and breathe and do all my stuff. And so I signed the form and they left. And then I actually started pushing before the doctor even came back in the room. Because if you don't have all that stuff in the way, you can sort of like let nature take its course. But my husband doesn't like blood and it's like, that was not a fun process for him. <laughs> um. Okay, so just to jump forward a little bit, so we're talking about surgeries, um, the worst way to die. I mean, this is one of those things I always am curious about from people, like your personal worst way to die. Um, you know, for me, I've always thought drowning just because it's a long struggle and you can see the surface and it's just not working out for you. And eventually you have to decide to start trying to breathe water. Um, Christina. Since, since, since pregnancy and labor was so easy for you, what's your worst way to die? Um, ever since I was a kid, even now as an adult, I have a recurring nightmare about being cornered. Like the outcome could be anything, like someone's chasing me or, you know, I'm being attacked by wolves, whatever. But it's always, I don't want to be cornered. So like for me, the nightmare is sort of like being trapped in a place where I can't do anything. Hmm. You know, so it might yeah, be... Yeah. Like I roll over in a car and I can't get out. That would be nightmarish for me. Got it. Got it. Got it. Steven. Um, I feel like if I say my worst way to die, I'm giving somebody out there ammunition, you know, <laughs> <laughs> revealing. Oh, so you should say your best way, your favorite yeah, way to die. Yeah, and then, yeah, Tell yeah, me, I get yeah. to live another 30 to 40 years quietly. <laughs> oh, that would be horrible. <laughs> um, Worst way to die. You know, your drowning thing, maybe that's it, Grady. And in, in sixth grade, a couple of high schoolers caught me and a friend at the pool when nobody was looking. And they held us underwater for, they'd spent like 25 or 30 minutes doing this. They held us underwater until we had to, until we had to breathe water. Then they'd drag us out and we'd throw up for a while. And they'd pull us back in and hold us underwater until we had to start breathing water. And it was terrible. I'm still like nervous and like it twitchy about that, you know? Um, yeah. So maybe, you know, but no, to tell you the truth, I think the worst way to die would be for some reason I'm in a cave spelunking and I try to wiggle through a narrow crevice oh, yeah. and I get, I get stuck and I'm stuck there for uh, until I die. That's that Christina, does that fit your criteria of being trapped? Yes. Yeah. Like okay. that's actually why I won't go spelunking. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's like, you know, when that movie, The Descent, the stuff I found this year, the cannibals were like a comfort to me when they finally saw yeah. them. When they're getting stuck in those crevices oh, yeah. and stuff, that was freaking me out. Um, Paul? I have a list. I mean, if you go into like childhood fears, it was always a fear of dying in nuclear war. That's still sort of oh, remains yeah. number one for me. As an adult, it's become sort of <laughs> something like the day after tomorrow, like a tsunami, like I don't know, just the idea that I, not only I know it's my end, I know it's everybody I, I know around me's end. Uh, I guess more personally, I would, fire, I think would be worse than drowning. Just the amount mm. of pain that must be. Um, but, you know, also a shark. <laughs> I don't want to be attacked by a shark. Yeah, well, I mean, who does? Right? But why a shark? You know, that's what I always wonder. Like, people are always like, I'm scared of sharks, but no one's like, I'm scared of an angry lion, which would do the same, if not worse, damage to you. But like, why a shark and not like a big carnivore on land? I was going to get my cell phone so I could show you the shark app that I have on my phone. <laughs> it shows me when white sharks, white sharks pop up 
on like oh, wow. there's a ton in Massachusetts. There's a ton in the Cape. I mean, there was just really? a, woman, a 63 year old New York City woman died in Maine, eaten by you know attacked by a great white just this past week. Um, I, I always find God, animals you know, killing I don't read people about lion. comforting. There, yeah, there aren't lion attacks here, and if there are, it's probably because some asshole kept it as a tried to keep it as a pet, and then they deserve it, right? <laughs> right. I feel like a shark just going for a swim isn't enough of a transgression to be deserved. To deserve being eaten by a shark. Get the hell out my ocean. <laughs> yeah. and, and I guess a shark would be worse than a like a um, killer whale because a killer whale just gulps you down, but a shark chews you in. You know, that would probably hurt more. I would guess. Yeah. Well, a, a shark is big enough to take off a limb or like bisect mm-hmm. you, but not big mm-hmm. enough to just swallow you whole. Yeah. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. Um, wait. So, is anyone here particularly scared of any particular animal besides sharks? I mean, not I'm scared, scared. of all fish. <laughs> Not scared per se, but I feel like I'm very cautious, especially when my son was young and we would go hiking. Like if we went hiking out west, you know, he liked he liked to run ahead of us, and I'd be like, you know, there's actually mountain lions out here and bears. So like you can't just run a, like the way you do at home. Um, but I don't think I'm scared of them per se. Maybe just cautious rationally yeah. yeah yeah well actually that's true that you mentioned bear i mean bear is the natural land shark not tiger i don't know where i got tiger from um <laughs> bears are everywhere and they're furry sharks that walk on their hind legs um you know, I think and actually I'm, there's I think a I'm... paper yeah go ahead no you go you go man. i was just gonna say there's a paperback from like 1989 called the predators about a dude in like it's supposed to be cuba but they don't say it's cuba but it's like a a country and he's an authoritarian figure and he wants to raise a lot of money so he does a cable pay-per-view match between the world's biggest grizzly and the world's biggest great white and so they're in like this arena that's half in the water and half not and they just like duke it out on pay-per-view um wow. which is like it's just so many problems with that book but it's not a wow. bad idea what were you gonna say oh, I, love, I used to love the show animal face off yeah me too. no animal wait what's this like, it was on like uh discovery channel probably like 10 or 15 years ago but they would have like experts argue about who would win a bear or a tiger they would build like jaws to test like bite strength but mm-hmm. then at the end they would have a virtual you know like two-bit graphic <laughs> yeah uh yeah. fight between the, the animals yeah. wait and great. did they ever I compete pit a bear against a shark no, no but i remember the walrus versus the polar bear was a surprise they had the walrus yeah. what uh, yeah are those walrus. tusks offensive yeah, tools yeah if the, oh, if the yeah. tusks if the, if the if the walrus gets the bear into the water was the supposition because the walrus hide is so thick even if the bear was like gnawing on it he would have time to get into the water if the bear follows him um just while we're on it really quickly what is a horrifying animal fact that you've always just carried around with you i mean steven i feel like your bot fly thing is is in that is up there you know just that's horrifying you know i have a fact that i don't think it's a fact i think one of my students told told it to me to get me killed you know he said he said he used to be a park ranger at um one of the parks around here and this was that this is what they all got taught and it has to be a lie he said if you get attacked by a grizzly bear then punch it in the ribs a lot because they have glass ribs practically and i think that's got to be a lie i don't think grizzly bears have glass ribs i think that they're tough all over (laughs) you know that's a little bit like that thing where people like if you get attacked by a shark kick it in the nose and it'll (laughs) swim away like there's a real (laughs) big chance you're gonna miss so every bear is like smog, except it's just a big square. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Tina, do you have, um, I don't know if I have any facts. I, this is just like the 12 year old of me. I've always like snickered at lizards and birds that have cloacas. It's just like, it just weirds me out that there's only one. There's only yeah. one yeah. ending or opening. Well, like someone explained to me once that birds have penises and it freaked me. I was like, what? And then I was like, oh yeah, that makes total <laughs> sense. Like, but it's, it's weird. Christina, animal fact that weirds you out. I probably have one, but I have completely forgotten it in the face of this conversation. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. You know, you know I, I, do, I have another one. I have another one. Like, I remember reading, I think I read this in Barry Lopez's Arctic Dreams, maybe, that um, the gallbladders of polar bears are intensely poisonous. And I'm always afraid that I'm going to be trapped somewhere. And I'm going to be eating a polar bear and I'm not going to know what's a gallbladder and what's a kidney and I'm going to eat a gallbladder and it's going to be over. You know? Yeah. 
That's, that's, you know, I think they should change the name of this panel to Christina Henry and three 12 year old boys. <laughs> um, okay. So right now we're in an apocalyptic situation. So Paul, you brought up nuclear war earlier and that was my big fear growing up in the seventies and eighties is just because I don't think it would be that bad. Like you would just, you're just gone basically unless you get radiation sickness and then it's horrifying. Um, but, but it seemed plausible. So let's, let's, let's go. We'll start with Christina. Um, how do you think the world, and I'm not saying the world's going to end right this minute, but, but we all have an apocalypse scenario in our head. What do you think's the most likely way the world's going to end? I do think it's disease. And like disease. Paul, I actually wrote a book last year about a, that came out last year about a pandemic. And a lot of people oh, yeah, have yeah. pointed out to me now that um, the disease in the book is a, starts as a dry cough that won't go away. Um, but I've always been a little bit of a germaphobe and I think that, um, probably there's way too many people on this planet and nature's trying to figure out a way to get rid of us to rebalance everything. And I think disease is going to take us down. I mean, I don't think it'll take out everybody, but I think that sooner or later, something's a, something apocalyptic disease wise will come along. Well, let me ask you a question real quick. And Paul, chime in here, just to sidebar for a minute. Chime in if you want. But when you're talking about nature taking us down, do you feel like nature's a self-correcting system? And, you know, it's like, ah, oh, humans, we suck and something's going to kill us. Or do you think we've just sort of spread our civilization so far? We've gotten into areas that are unleashing uh, viruses and bacteria we're not prepared for. Or I mean, are those I just the same thing? Yeah, I think it is the same thing. But also, like, if you look at the history of the world, there's been, you know, numerous, like, sort of great cataclysms on this planet that take down the dominant species sort of intermittently. So I just think that sooner or later, our time's going to be up. I just think it's the way things are. So bleak, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, like as terrified I am of the end. I mean, I think what you said before is like define it. It's not going to be everybody. There's just the place, you know, short of asteroids or all-out nuclear war. Um, you know, there's going to be some sort of survival. I mean, I do think civilization in some ways is a lot hardier than people want to believe. Um, you know, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I think you know climate change is going to change everything irrevocably does that mean it's gonna be the death of all humans i mean i don't know i mean just in talking to some people i know that have lived through other countries like political apocalypse you know it, you know or collapse of economy or collapse of you know regimes take over and you know these people always tell me you'd be surprised at how like people go on like they, they figure out a way you know it's you know it doesn't become mad max necessarily um you know, but that said, <laughs> you know, like Christina says, I mean, in some, you know, in some sense, it's just a matter of time. But so just out of wanted. curiosity, when you were doing the research for Survivor Song, did that just reinforce your pre-existing notions about pandemics being bad? Or did you just discover a lot of information there? You're like, oh, yeah, these are really, really horrifying. So, like, I really didn't go in depth into other pandemics at all. And if anything, um, like, my two characters early on in the book have a discussion about, you know, one of them thinks the world would end easily, the other one doesn't. Um, and then this happens. You know, and I purposely try to, you know, I say in the book at some point, this is not an apocalypse. This is not the end of Massachusetts. You know, you know things will recover. It may take a while. Um, you know, so that's the way I approach it in the book. I mean, partly because of how quickly the virus acted. In my book, there's no, that would be easy to quarantine. Like just what little, what little I know about epidemiology is like if something's going to affect you within an hour, if people just say, okay, all right, wait a minute, we'll just, we'll actually follow the rules. It would be easier to, to contain something like that. Um, so, I mean, I was purposely not trying to write like an end of the world book. Sure. I was trying to write like thing, you know, something that happened that would make it, you know, awful for however many months to a year. Um, yeah. So. I don't know. I mean, I certainly, I don't, I didn't take any comfort from any of the research I did in that book, if anything, like when, when March hit, like people have joked, oh, because you write horror and you wrote this book, like you were probably ready, prepared for the, prepared for this. Like, no, I spent two weeks on the couch in a metaphorical fetal position watching <laughs> Mythbusters and, um, you know, the zoo on Animal Planet. <laughs> 
Steven, apocalypse. Um. Oh, how do I think the world can end or yeah. will end? Yeah. Yeah. I think the thing I'm scared about are those gamma bursts that just kind of come randomly out of the cosmos and just psh, wipe out everything. Um. I think if one of those, one of those might be hurtling for us right now. We don't know it, you know, and they, they move so fast that it's going to be hard to see coming and it's all over when one of those hits, man. Wait, I thought gamma bursts just pass through the planet. They don't? I don't know. Maybe I'm using Hulk mythology. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not challenging yeah. you. I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. I thought, I thought that they were pretty destructive. Yeah. Like a, yeah. no, you like might a, be right. Like from, I don't know. From like a, from like a solar flare, you mean, or? Yeah. Something like, well, yeah, but like, yeah, those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they would, wipe, I mean, out like all, they would wipe out all electronics and, and stuff like that. I mean, well, sure. yeah, maybe, maybe it'd be like an EMP. I, I didn't even think about that, yeah. but I, I just thought that we'd all die when it hit, when it, when it yeah. hit us, you know? Um, that actually sounds still, like, a, yeah, go ahead. I guess, Maybe it's an unfounded um, fear. Maybe I can like relax now if it's just going to pass <laughs> through us, you know? <laughs> well, that actually kind of is relaxing. It's like, we're all just going to yeah. die in this burst of yeah. gamma radiation and we yeah. can't predict it or do anything about it. We'll all hulk out yeah. for a moment and then <laughs> <laughs> a planet of hulk. Um, so one of the things we were talking about earlier is people when we were kids showing us horror or us showing them like movies and books, you know, and passing that stuff around. And I was thinking, you know, like Paul, you, uh, there's, there's a real um, telling uh, narrative kind of drive to Survivor's song. I mean, it starts out talking with this direct address to the reader. And Christina, a lot of your books like sort of play with fairy tales and those like fairy tale or not really fairy tales, but those sort of fairy tale narrative traditions and, and you know, that address the reader. And Stephen, certainly like you've done a direct addresses to the reader before. And also in, in um, The Only Good Indians, I mean, it really is, you know, it's based on a myth. I mean, what what is it that we like about like passing this stuff along, this sort of viral, let me tell you something horrifying and i don't mean why do we like writing horror i mean what is it about even as a kid like something scares me so i have to tell other kids about it i have to describe it to them what's this impulse has anyone thought about that or is that just me no that's a good question like i remember when i was a kid and we'd find some dead animal decaying around the corner in the ditch by the fence wherever we had to all we had to like one person had to be an envoy and go get everybody to come look at this maggot mm -hmm. riddle gross thing you know um or when Faces of the De Faces of Death started circulating on VHS, we were all passing that around. Like, you've got to see this. It's the worst thing ever, you know? Um, why do we do that? I mean, I think it makes us feel alive. Or it makes, uh, yeah, it makes, us, it makes me feel alive anyways when I see terrible stuff. And maybe that's like a wrong wiring that I have or something. I don't know. But I think it makes me feel alive. Yeah. Christina, do you? Um, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about how when we were kids, we would always tell you know, urban legends to each other. And you'd always be yeah. trying to convince the other person that it was, no, it was really true. Like my friend knew the guy who this happened to. And I think it's in a lot of ways, it's just a variation on, I always say that as storytellers, we're just sort of playing this generations long game of telephone. where like, we're all retelling the same stories we've heard, but we're retelling them in our own way. Like when you have a line of kids who are playing telephone and the first person says, you know, cheese and rice and the last kid says ham and cheese, you know, it's like a completely different narrative by the time it reads the, reaches the end because everybody filters it through their experience, through their mood, through whatever. Um, I feel like, you know, when you're trying to share something like that with somebody else, you're trying to share some piece of your narrative with somebody else. And then you hope then that that'll get passed on. Yeah. Paul? Yeah, I, I love uh, Christina's answer because I do think part of the fun of writing in horror is joining in like this, you know, long conversation that is the genre. But maybe, I don't know, this just occurred to me, maybe even, you know, without thinking of the genre. Um, I've been to some weddings and funerals where I've heard this, and I think it's sort of an interesting saying um, that joy shared is multiplied, grief shared is divided. And I think in the case of sharing something scary, it's a little bit of both. Like if it's on the grief side, if it's really scary, you sort of get to break it up into pieces by sharing it. And there's a, you know, there's a comfort in that shared acknowledgement, oh, there's something terrible out there. I don't have to carry this on my own. I have it, you know, it's now more people know. 
but there is also sort of that joy part of it. I don't know, for whatever reason, it's exciting. <laughs> you know, you want your friends to know, like you, my dad taking me to Jaws, was, you know, scarred me for life, but for whatever reason, he wanted to scar me for life and take me to Jaws by telling me that he, he undersold it by telling me, hey, uh, in this movie, there's a scene that totally captures what it's like to, to catch a fish. That was how he, he sold Jaws. Up. He was right when Quint caught the fish and he's watching the line. It was cool, but yeah. <laughs> Such a <laughs> the terrible rest of the movie pretext. Was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think he's um, more just in the, the grief part of it, just putting it all on me in that one. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's interesting actually what y'all were saying. Because, you know, I was listening to this history thing recently, um, podcast, mm-hmm. I believe the kids are calling them now. I don't know why I couldn't say that. Um, and uh, they were talking about Stonehenge and they were like, well, you know, forget about what its purpose is. The purpose might have been to move these rocks and to build this memory. And when these rocks moved across the country, it took so long. Like people would run out of their houses and help drag them for like a mile or two. And then they'd tell their kids, you know, we did this, we moved these things. And they become these stories that just got told down. The point was to build this cultural memory that would last for hundreds of years, which I thought is kind of like what y'all are saying. Um, until we're wiped out by gamma rays. So <laughs> that's time for us right now. Uh, I think what people have learned and what we've, both, we've multiplied here is bot flies, great white sharks are everywhere off the coast of New England and Freddy Cougar doesn't want you to pee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us. Th- those are the many faces of horror unless it's Max Headroom's face with green glowing eyes. Um, <laughs> and thanks. Thank you, Grady, that was great. Thank thanks, you. Grady. Thanks everybody. Mm-hmm.